I'm Carol Shirk with the Dodge County Master Garden Association. I just want to welcome you to our meeting. In 1492, not only did Columbus come, but an exchange of plants between the old world and the new world began. And what plants did the Native Americans and then later the Europeans use in a time before we had grocery stores and drug stores and hardware stores? And how did they know which ones were safe to eat and which ones were not? That's what Kate Redman is here to tell us tonight. Kate is a interpretive naturalist, environmental educator. She's excited about wetlands and prairies and riding and insects, especially dragonflies, carnivorous plants, native orchids, and photography. She served for 10 years as a founding member of the Fred, Fred's. Friends of the Cedarburg Bog, she wrote the online field guide to the Mequon Nature Preserve, and as the bug lady, she's written more than 350 essays about local insects and other invertebrates. So please join me in welcoming Kate Redman. Thank you. Uh, and, and what has been said already about how did they know what was good to eat is what we call a teaching question, which I like to throw out right at the start of the program. Because while I'm showing all the pictures, you can be thinking about how people knew about that. And we'll, we'll get to that at the end. Um, I should confess that I am not a gardener at all, master or otherwise. Um, I have a bunch of geraniums that I abuse all summer, and then I bring them inside and I abuse them all winter. It's amazing how long they can go without water. <laughs> but uh, I, I do not garden. Um, and I'm also not a browser, uh, but I am a history geek. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is more in the history geek line. Um, and I would um, say that if you're interested in using plants as, as food or medicine, that um, uh, you, you do your homework. You don't say, well, gee, back in but we're still in September. Back in September, that woman talked to us about such and such, and I seem to recall it looked like this, and I think I'll try it. Um, not a good idea. So what we're going to do tonight is look at the landscape with a little different filter. You and I might look at this prairie scene and say, wow, tall grass prairie. Isn't that beautiful? But if you had lived here 200 or 300 or 5,000 years ago, you might look at that tall grass prairie and say, if I have a headache, I can go to that plant. If I need fiber, I can go to that plant. If I need an aspirin, I can go to a different plant. And so we're going to start to appreciate a little bit of how uh, the people who preceded us here saw the landscape. And I'm going to throw a huge number of facts at you. I don't think you're going to, we're not having a quiz. Uh, I'm, you won't remember them all. I don't even remember them all. I always spend my time going home by saying, ah, oh, I forgot to tell them such and such. I forgot to tell them such and such. So I don't remember it all either. But what I hope that you will appreciate by the end of this is that if I gave you a plant list for any park or natural area or even wide open spaces in the area, that you would find that probably 95% of the plants that, were, uh, that occurred there were used in some way or another. And I might show you a picture of a Coreopsis, and I might tell you one or two things that they did with Coreopsis, but there might be six or seven or 10 different uses for Coreopsis where we'd be sending out for pizza at midnight if we, uh, if we talked about it all. So there are two groups of people who contributed plants that we are going to be talking about. The first are the Native Americans. And there's a lot of archaeological interest in who came here, when they came here, how they came here. You and I probably learned that 10,000 years ago when the glacier melted, people walked over the Bering Land Bridge at the top of the world and came down into North America. And that's certainly true, but it is certainly not the whole part of the story. Because uh, first of all, we'll review the water cycle a little bit. Um, the water cycle can be summed up in seven words. Water comes down, water goes back up. So the water that comes down, whether it's in the form of snow or sleet or, or rain, whatever, 
falls on the land, falls in the water. Eventually, a lot of it evaporates back into the sky and uh, gets attached to clouds and falls again. At the height of the last glacier, only half of that form formula was working. Water was coming down, usually in the form of snow because it was cold during the, during the glacier, but it was getting locked into the glaciers. And so instead of going back up, it stayed there. So water kept, continued to evaporate out of the oceans, and then it would came, come over the continent, it would land, and it would stay. So as a result of that, mm -hmm. at the height of the last glacier, the level of the oceans had fallen 250 to 300 feet. And that is why there was a Bering Land Bridge. That was, that's a stretch of land that is underwater most of the time, but when the ocean level went down, it got exposed so people could walk from Asia to North America. They did not start out to, to uh, discover a new continent. And they were walking across that land bridge with some of the prehistoric land mammals that we've seen pictures of, the giant land sloths and the saber-toothed tigers and uh, giant beavers the size of a pickup truck. And they were all coming over the bridge at the same time. And at the same time that that Bering Land Bridge was exposed, about two and a half million acres of land along the continental shelf was also exposed. So the easiest route was to walk along next to the continent. So people walked along, took the trail next to the continent. They camped there. They lived there for years. They were not in any rush. They were having children and walking along and finding food. It wasn't a fast trip. But when the water level came back up again, that put all of these uh, fossils underwater. So it's a little hard to track that. But uh, that was a lot of, lot of dry land to walk on. And the, the upper third, at least, of the United States was covered with ice. So in some theories, they walked along the coast, and they got to the edge of the ice, and they turned left and headed for the interior of the country. And that's a wonderful theory, except that uh, Professor Overstreet has some digs down in the Kenosha area, and he has dated some of his fossils back to his human inhabitant fossils back 13,000 years. And Professor Adavasio, who has a dig near Pittsburgh, also has 13,000 year old fossils of, you know, of cutting on mammoth bones, things like that. So apparently they got here before they got here. But <laughs> There are a number of really interesting theories. There's a, there's a uh, dig down in Monteverde in Chile that also has 13,000 year old human habitation. And there's, uh, underneath that hearth, there might be another hearth that is 33,000 years old. So I could go on, this is some really fascinating stuff. There might be a group that came over from Spain, you know, 25,000 years ago, whatever it was. But it's a fascinating subject and if you thought they walked over the top of the world on the land bridge was the end of the story. It is not the end of the story. Stay tuned. So it took 10,000 years to get from the top of the world down to the bottom of, uh, of South America. Um, it was, excuse me, it's 10,000 miles to go, go from the top to the bottom, and it took about 7,000 years. Okay, let's go and have the next one. Change the, oh, I got, that's right, we talked. The other group of people who contributed to our plants were the Europeans. And apparently, Christopher Columbus consulted a mathematician who told him that there was a very good probability that if you sailed west, you could find the east. The other way to get to the east was to go across <laughs> Europe and go across Asia. It was a route called the Silk Road or the Silk Route. There was a land route and a water route, and both of them were long and dangerous, and a lot of people started out on that route that didn't come back. So Christopher Columbus decided that by sailing from Italy, he could get out there and he could find China. And he would have been right except for one thing, and that's called the, the New World. He bumped into the New World and found Native Americans, found a bunch of plants. He had told his subscribers that he was going to bring back not only gold but spices. And so he did collect some plants and he hauled them back to Europe and they tasted terrible. <laughs> and he told his, his uh, subscribers that maybe I just don't know how to collect these things properly. I'll try on, you know, give me some money for another trip and I'll go back over and try again. 
So at the time that Christopher Columbus bumped into America, there were about 300 different food crops that were being farmed here. Uh, none of them were any plant that the Europeans knew anything about. And from what I've read, about three-fifths of today's farm crops ha are, have their origin in the New World. I put Cracker Jacks on there because there's a real um, um, excited author named Jack Weatherford who thinks that Cracker Jacks are one of the Native American contributions to our cuisine because after all they made popcorn and they made maple syrup, so who's to say <laughs> that they didn't pour the maple syrup on top of, uh, of the popcorn? So there was this gigantic exchange of plants and animals between the old world and the new. These are some New World plants that, came over, that went over to Europe. Wild sunflowers were a plant that was used by Native Americans for their oil, and the Europeans recognized it as something that was good for not only getting oil, but for uh, feeding livestock. So they did the plant breeding that uh, resulted in the super-duper sunflowers that we have today. My children used to say that it was really no fun watching television with either me or my husband. He was big into birds, and so when you're watching the Waltons, which happens in West Virginia, and you hear a scaled quail, which is a bird that lives in the desert southwest. You know, you could bogus. But there is a wonderful Garfield cartoon where Garfield goes back in time and makes lasagna for Emperor Nero. And so they were getting a bogus from their mother when that happened because um, tomatoes are a new world plant. And tomatoes did not land in Europe until about 1550. And so they had a lot of pasta at that time, but they did not have any tomato sauce until after 1550. Tomatoes were considered a really decorative plant. They were considered to be a poisonous plant. Um, it, it took some young man uh, who wanted to commit suicide by eating tomatoes to uh, the, cr the crowd gathered and he ate the tomatoes and nothing happened to him. So then, then it's, people started figuring it out. But Thomas Jefferson used to cultivate tomatoes. Um, evening primrose on the top right is a plant, a new world plant. The root is edible. It takes a couple hours of cooking uh, to make the thing tender. It's a very woody root, but just the first year root is edible. And that went over to Europe and they had never seen anything like a turkey before. And I don't know whether it's this turkey or there's a, a species in Central America called the oscillated turkey, which is even uh, more strangely marked. But turkeys went over to uh, to the old world. Uh, back in the day, turkey was kind of a code word for exotic. So if something, you called something turkey or Turkish uh, 500 years ago, it meant that it was some, like something nobody had ever seen before. So there were also old world plants and animals that came to this country. Uh, honeybees were called white man's flies by the Native Americans. Uh, we, there are plenty of pollinators here, but there were no honeybees. Um, apples came over on the boat like my ancestors did and the Native Americans had no hoofed milk giving herd animals. So no cheese, no ice cream, no yogurt. It explains why about 75 percent of Native Americans are lactose intolerant because they did not have milk in their uh, uh, background growing up. But the hoofed milk-giving herd animals also brought with them to this country smallpox because that was um, endemic in some of these herds. That's why when Jenner made his vaccine against smallpox, the first person he tested on was a milkmaid because she was exposed to cows all the time. So you know, Google it, it's, it's a great story. But uh, that was one of the ways that smallpox got into this country. So there is a professor that said, our children are growing up in a European landscape, and if you ask a kid to tell you six or eight wildflowers, they're going to tell you daisies and dandelions and chicories and all those roadside plants that are not native. Uh, chicory on the upper left, um, there were four different cultivars of, of chicory. Two of them were used for uh, salad herbs. One of them was cultivated for its roots. And the other one, one was cultivated because it's a, a fodder, a, a livestock fodder. And they planted it in the field just the way we plant um, uh, alfalfa. And that's uh, something that's starting to catch on today. You can make multiple cuttings just like you can with alfalfa. The root uh, was used to make a coffee substitute. And you can, if you're down in Louisiana, you can buy Lu Louisiana uh, coffee and that has a chicory additive. 
Um, too much chicory is not good for your eyes, but, um, and some people don't like the taste, it's a little bit bitter. And the other thing about chicory is that it's kind of an uncoffee. If you're a couch potato, chicory, coffee might get you up off the couch, but chicory won't because it's, it's a little calmer than, than coffee is. Dandelions are one of my favorite wildflowers, plenty of vitamin A and D in the leaves. Uh, we all know that the flowers make a nice wine. Uh, the scientific name of dandelion is Taraxicum officinale, which means the official cure for everything. So it was used medicinally for uh, a lot of different purposes. Teasel in the middle on the top was brought over on purpose by people who were in the um, milling industry because they would make fabric and they would use the really needly teasel heads to comb the, uh, the material so that you would bring up a nap like flannel. So in the bottom left we have bouncing bet which is the old English name for the washerwoman and if you take the stem of that and the roots and you pound them with water you've got soapy water. That was uh, a soap, the, a soap in a plant. And of course in the bottom uh, Right hand side we have uh, broadleaf plantain which has all kinds of antiseptic properties. I talked to, I gave this program one time and a farmer came up afterwards and said, when I was a kid, if I got a cut, my father used to take a plantain leaf and put it between my skin and the bandage when he bandaged it up. He said, I never had an infection and I never had a scar. <laughs> so it also, if you pound the leaf, clean leaves, you can use it on itchy things like mosquito bites and poison ivy. What? bee stings, mm -hmm. and it's related to Metamucil. Um, if you do any sort of uh, invasive control, you know these two plants. Uh, Queen Anne's lace on the, on the left, what the, back in 1609, the French developed the root of Queen Anne's lace, which is Daucus carata, into the, wild, the carrot that we know today, and it became a really, really popular plant. Uh, for people and the, the colonists when they came over planted it in their kitchen gardens. The other one is wild parsnip and wild parsnip uh, is, has, should have a big beware sign on it because there's a, a mathematical formula sap plus sunshine equals scar. So if you go to do any control of uh, wild parsnip you should always wear long sleeves and long pants. Sap plus sweat plus sunshine is so at any rate, but this, this is a plant that was brought over in 1609 to Virginia. Within 50 years it was up in Massachusetts and 150 years after that the Native Americans had adopted it and the soldiers who were going through Massachusetts trying to eliminate the Indians were burning caches with baskets and baskets of wild parsnip root in them. It's a, the, the root again is, an, is edible if you use the first year root, it's a uh, two year plant. So. So apparently this is a topic that's interested people for a very long time. Mullen can really take over the landscape. It's a pretty plant. Uh, the seeds were used as a fish poison. So if you, if you want to go fishing and you're a little lazy to do a little casting of your line, you throw the seeds in the water and the fish float to the surface. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other uses, medicinal uses for um, for mullen, both for man and beast, a lot of, uh, of treatments of bronchial diseases. Um, I love common names. And when I see the common names of this on the right hand side, candle wick, because the mid vein of the leaf was used in oil lamps as a wick. Flannel leaf, if you've ever touched um, mullen, you know that it's got a very fuzzy leaf lungwort because it treated lung diseases, torchwort because Roman soldiers used to use the dried um, uh, old stalk of the melon, they'd dip it in tallow and they'd use it for torches. Hag's taper because it was associated with witches and it was also associated with spells against witches. And Quaker Rouge, my favorite one, the Quaker women were not supposed to wear makeup. So before their sweetie came over, they would take some a mullen leaf and they would just rub their cheeks a little bit. And the problem is that, that uh, mullen often causes a little dermatitis. So you would get this little irritation red, but it looked like rouge and they looked lovely for their sweeties. Okay. Some wildflower books will tell you that yarrow, top left, and lamb's quarters, the other top, 
uh, and self-heal on the bottom uh, left. I have trouble with left and right. I do north and south really easily. But, and um, uh, nettle are alien. But that's a real good question. My uh, oldest daughter is an archaeologist, and the lamb's quarters, uh, the top right plant, uh, she was looking at plant material that was included in digs from 1,000 and 2,000 years ago, and they had lamb's quarters in there. So if it is an alien plant, it did not come over after Columbus. Maybe it came across the top of the world with the people who came across the top of the world. Maybe it's a circumpolar plant, and it was here anyhow. Uh, it's, it's related to quinoa. And it's easy to grow, and, um, and it has seeds that don't have to be treated at all before they are used. Nettle in the bottom right corner has a fiber. There are medicinal and, and edible properties to nettle, but it has a fiber in it. And Native American women would walk around with dried nettle stems, which they would rub against their thighs to release the fiber from the rest of the stem. And the fiber was, could be woven into a, a material that was almost like linen. And when you see a picture of those Conestoga wagons going across the, uh, the west, almost all of those uh, tops of the Conestoga wagons were made out of nettle fiber. And it was also used to make tents and some other things. So a uh, really, really important plant. So the moral of the story, as I said, is not how well you remember tonight's jumble of information, but do your own homework. Um, the top plant in the middle there is water hemlock. It's the most poisonous plant in the hemisphere. If you eat any of it, you have got 30 minutes to live. So get your affairs in order. Okay, but it is in the same family as Queen Anne's lace and uh, caraway and fennel and anise. And when you look at the seed heads, it looks like caraway and fennel and anise. So if you're browsing, know what you're putting in your mouth before you put it in your mouth. The uh, purple nightshade, which is the other plant, uh, is a, another good example of plants that are in a family that has some really edible stuff in it and some really poisonous stuff in it. Purple nightshade is not good for you, but tomatoes and potatoes are in the same family, and they are. So, so we're going to cruise through some of uh, the major plant communities around here and see what was growing in them and how they were used. Um, the people who came over here, uh, the first settlers, the first pilgrims and Puritans, were by and large city people. They were not farmers, which made it twice as hard for them to make a living once they got here. And they had never seen anything like the forests that they saw as soon as they landed in New England or, or in, um, in the, in the mid-Atlantic. They were terrified by these forests. Often they would find some of the berry crops, which you know we all love to come across wild strawberries or wild blueberries or something like that. And they would say, oh, you know, this is my lucky day. I found a big bunch of blueberries. There are a whole bunch of berry crops that need to have open sunlight. They don't grow underneath the trees. And the Native Americans worked hard, either with fire or with um, uh, girdling trees, to keep those patches of blueberries and strawberries and raspberries open. Uh, not only are they good to eat, but um, a lot of these had medicinal uses too. Um, strawberry was used in, uh, to assist in childbirth, and it also has a chemical in it which is good for dissolving tartar. So if you want to uh, help keep your teeth healthy, healthy eat a lot of uh, strawberries. Um, blueberries, in almost every journal that I look at, blueberries are credited with helping to control diabetes. And they talk about blueberry tea, but also the blueberries themselves. And, and a lot of these, these fruits uh, were eaten fresh, but a lot of them were also dried and turned into loaves, concentrated loaves of fruit, which were kind of equivalent to, to tomato paste when it comes to you know, boiling something down. Uh, and, and a lot of them were pounded into pemmican, which was a combination of fruit and, um, and meat and you know, dried meat and fats. But with, with the blueberries and diabetes, um, whether it was blueberry tea made from the leaves, and it's kind of dangerous to just grab any member of the blueberry family and make tea from the leaves because some of them are not good for you. 
Uh, when we have blueberry tea these days, we expect it to taste like blueberries, and I'm not sure that the blueberry leaf tea that they used 400 years ago did. But whether it was the fruit or the leaf, uh, the leaf tea or both, uh, but all these all these books say that it was good for diabetes. Some more um, forest plants up on the top left we have mandrake or may apple, what the kids call umbrella plants, and it has to have two leaves coming out the top before it's mature enough to have a flower and a fruit. So the fruit is in the middle, and the fruit, um, it was called citron fruit sometimes because it's a very mildly lemony flavor. Uh, medicinally, it was used for a gynecological medicine, and it is still the source of that gynecological medicine today. Um, one of my favorite stories that I found out when I've been researching this stuff is when DeWitt Clinton, who you all remember from high school, is the guy who um, was the governor of New York when the Erie Canal was built. When he was pitching the Erie Canal to his investors, increased commerce in May Apple was one of the things that he put in the plus column for building the Erie Canal. So apparently it was a very popular fruit on the frontier. The people used to make pies and tarts with it. It's, it's, as I say, it's kind of tasteless. It's a little bit lemony. But the plant itself was also used, as it uh, says underneath the, the picture there, um, the potato is a new world plant. The potato traveled to the old world and then it traveled back to New England where uh, May apple was used as a, uh, as a pesticide to keep the pests off of the potatoes. It was called the Irish potato by then. Uh, top right corner is bloodroot which has a red juice inside of it which um, uh, also causes dermatitis but it was the Menominee word for bloodroot is to make the gourd red. So it was used as a, as a dye for baskets and gourds. One of the answers to the questions, the teaching question that was posed at the start uh, is the doctrine of signature, as you can see in the bottom left-hand side. That plant is liverwort. And according to the doctrine of signature, which is an idea that is not just American, it's an idea that is around the world, if a plant looks like your liver, then it's good for your liver. If it looks like your heart, then it's good for your heart. If it's got a succulent stem, then it's good for your skin, et cetera, et cetera. Maidenhair fern was uh, used as a treatment for scalp and hair disorders because it has that long black midrib in the fern leaflet. So doctrine of signature, um, back in 1880, this thing reached its peak because uh, obviously hepatica, was, which is one of our spring ephemerals, was used as a treatment for liver diseases, and everybody agreed that it wasn't a very effective treatment. But it continued to be used as a liver treatment, uh, and I think that it was close to a half a million pounds of hepatica leaves were harvested in 1880 alone to treat ineffectually liver diseases, and it's something that was driven by the then equivalent of big pharma. The, the guys in the medicine wagon said, this is good for you, so man, they kept doing it. So, so that's one of your answers already. Uh, and the bottom one is wild ginger, bottom right, and wild ginger um, smells a little bit gingery. It's not the culinary ginger, though. But it has some antibiotic properties, and so a lot of Native Americans would throw it into the pot whenever they were cooking any meat that was a little bit iffy. And they would also take it on the war trail with them to protect against sorcery. And I suspect getting a bad case of food poisoning on the war trail was, uh, was a, you know, a good definition of sorcery. It kind of incapacitated you for a while, so they just were proactive about that. Uh, bed straw, top right, is in the same family as coffee and was used as a coffee substitute, but it was also used as a freckle remover and a diuretic. Uh, daisy fleabane on the bottom right-hand side, the dried flowers of daisy fleabane were taken as a snuff. If you had a really, really thick head cold, then you used the daisy fleabane snuff, and that helped you sneeze out some of the stuff that was uh, in your sinuses. And the wild columbine in the bottom middle, um, interesting plant. It had some medicinal uses, but I'm more interested in the fact that it was, uh, had some magical uses, too. Uh, young men used to take the seeds of it and, um, and rub the seeds on their hands, and then they would go up and shake hands with a young woman that they wanted to woo. And it was supposed to persuade her 
about his virtues. And as a result, a lot of young women stayed away from a lot of young men during certain seasons of the year when they were wooing their, their young women. And another one was if you took the seeds of, of wild columbine and you put them in the pipes that were smoked at ceremonies, it was very persuasive and you could uh, turn somebody around to your point of view if you used those seeds. So, you know, we laugh, what do we know? We, ha we have lucky things too, you know, athletes who wear the same underwear for six games in a row, whatever it is, we have, oh. yeah. <laughs> okay, pretend I didn't say that. Uh, okay, so uh, some of the trees in the forest, um, elm bark was used as medicinally, but also uh, there's a uh, elm called slippery elm or red elm, and some people call it piss elm. Uh, some people say it smells like licorice and some people say it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But um, an alternative to when you're making maple syrup to cooking and cooking and cooking and cooking the maple syrup, which was very difficult for the Native Americans to do before the Europeans got here with metal pots. If you were there here before that, you were using birch bark pots and you were heating up stones and you, you were putting the sap in these birch bark pots and you were dumping a hot stone in there and, when the, and then that would heat up the, the sap. And doing that over and over and over and over and over again, you know when you're cooking sap into syrup, it takes 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. So that's a lot of hot rocks in birch bark vessels. So they were real happy to see those, those uh, metal pots get here. But they also made, using slippery elm, they also made these gigantic uh, vats for maple syrup. They would collect it in smaller buckets made out of elm bark, but they would put the, uh, the sap into these 200 gallon big flat vats. And if you have this big flat vat of um, maple sap and you let it sit overnight and it freezes, you take off the ice in the morning and then the next day it freezes again or the next night and you take off the ice again. And you're doing the same thing mm -hmm. as you would be doing with boiling it. Of course you had to keep the kids and the dogs and the flies and things like that out of it, but uh, it, it gets better. Uh, so that was uh, one used for the elm. Uh, leather wood is the uh, plant in the middle, top and bottom, and that's a little shrub that grows in nice rich uh, woodlands. Um, dermatitis again, it has a really nice strong bark and they used to have contests to see if the strong men could pull the bark at each end and actually pull it apart and mostly they could not. But it was also used uh, to weave baskets and again some people get dermatitis from the sap. Um, basswood on the right top and bottom, almost all the twine on the frontier was made out of the soft inner bark of basswood and it also had medicinal and edible properties uh, including uh, sort of tranquilizer properties. And the bottom left-hand plant is amelanchier or shad, shad bush or juneberry. Um, and that uh, service berry is another name for it. Um, that was a really, really, really important plant on the frontier and a major ingredient of pemmican. And I'll tell you really quickly why it's called service berry. Back in the day when there were circuit riding preachers who went from, uh, some, from settlement to settlement during the winter time they couldn't get back into the settlements. But about the time that this plant is in bloom was the time that the ice was breaking up and the, and the preachers were able to get back into some of the mountain settlements to marry people or bury people or do whatever services needed to be done. So the blooming of the plant was associated with the arrival of the, of the preacher. More trees, um, oak trees on the left top and bottom uh, red oak, the red oak, black oak, oak bunch, you can always tell because the ends of the lobes are pointed. Mm -hmm. And the white oak group, you can tell because the ends of the lobes are rounded. They both have acorns. The acorns were used for food. Uh, if you are uh, looking for something you can use right away, then you use the white oak. If you, the, the, the black oak, red oak acorns were kind of bitter and they had to be boiled and a little bit of lye, ashes were, were put in there to kind of calm them down a little bit. Hickory also was used um, as a food plant and amazingly, shagbark hickory makes a pretty nice maple, or a pretty nice syrup. Um, I, I was reading a Wisconsin magazine uh, not long ago and they were talking about cooking the twigs, I think it was, but they, uh, all, the, the one I read about talked about tapping the actual tree. 
And those were very, very, very important plants in construction. Um, we have beech on the top, uh, top right, and that was a very important food plant, both for man and, uh, and wildlife, um, really high in protein nut. And ash trees in the middle on the bottom. It's amazing to me that, again, there was this superstition about ash trees that wasn't just in this country. It was for a long time, and it was in other parts of the world. Scottish women had their cradles made with ash runners so that snakes wouldn't crawl over the, up the cradle and, and get into the baby's cradle. Now, I, I'm not even sure what the snake situation is in Scotland. I, I know that there's nothing poisonous there. But, uh, and apparently back in the days of Pliny, back you know, a couple thousand years ago and beyond, the belief was that ash could protect you from snakes. This is a tree that was sacred to a number of different Native American tribes. I always figure when I'm doing a PowerPoint that you're intelligent enough to read it yourself. So, okay. okay. It's like the bison. Um, we had bison here in Wisconsin. Bison ranged all the way to the Atlantic. And when they killed a bison, they used everything from the hoofs to the horns to the tail, everything. The, the Indians were the ones who figured out how to turn maple sap into maple syrup and beyond into maple sugar. And it not only was a, it a sweet treat on a landscape that didn't have a lot of sweets on it, but it was a really good trade item. I lived near Newburgh, and there was a big sugar bush um, not far away from where I live. Uh, the, Highway 33 was actually a very important uh, trading route for the Menominee and the other tribes that were in this area. And uh, I read one old journal that said that the, the people who settled here were happy to have the maple syrup and the maple sugar, but they wished that the Indians would not use the same pots that they boiled the fish in. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So now we're going to head for the wetlands. Wars were fought about wetlands, and this is why. Um, the, on the far left, we have spatter dock lily, bullhead lily, yellow water lily. And underneath that is the root, or rhizome of it. And I want you to picture this, women. At this time of year, if you were a Native American and you lived near a wetland, you would be walking through a wetland in the water with bare feet, using your toes to find the roots of these yellow water lilies. And when you found one underwater with your toes, you would wiggle it out with your toes. And you would throw it into a special canoe that you were trailing behind you. It had low sides. And you have a little rope over your shoulder. And these um, roots are as big as your arm. Mm -hmm. And they used them for all the things that we use potatoes for. And I read one account uh, where someone was, was traveling in uh, the Ohio River Valley and uh, observing the Miami Indians and said that they, had, they put it in a pit fire underground and they cooked it for four, uh, four days and it tasted like mutton, which I'm not, I'm not sure is a good thing or not. But um, <laughs> uh, as far as um, cattails are concerned, there's something edible on the cattail root 12 months out of the year. There's the cattail leaves themselves, which were used for weaving sides for summer dwellings and floors and all kinds of other things, baskets. And then when the Europeans got here, they were used for caning chairs. Mm -hmm. I went to school at Cornell, and at the north end of Cornell is Montezuma Wildlife Refuge, and it's a big wetland, and that was a really big chair caning area. Um, besides that, the flowers of the uh, cattail, the male flower and the female flower are on the same stalk. The pollen, the male pollen, is very yellow and it's used as a flower substitute. It's got a lot of protein in it. It makes a really good pancake. We, I've had it half and half with regular flour. And the female flower was cooked like uh, corn on the cob. So, and also some of the Midwestern tribes here, when a baby was born in the wintertime, they would take the fluff and put it into a basket and they would put the new baby into the basket because it was a nice warm place to lay a baby. So, The eupatoriums are really, really, really important. There's a eupatorium which is poisonous. It's called white snake root. 
And if you've heard of, um, of Abraham Lincoln's mother, she died of something called milk sickness. And milk sickness was a sickness that the cows got when they grazed on white snake root, which is one of the eupatoriums. The, the calves get the tremors when they uh, nurse, and, the, uh, it, and it kills people sometimes. But these two were really, really, really important medicines on the frontier. Um, unfortunately, the Joe Pye weed on the right was used as a spring tonic, and apparently it tastes just awful. And strong men used to run away when their wives came at them with a spoonful of this <laughs> good spring tonic. Um, but both of them were used for some of the really serious problems. There was no malaria in this country until the English brought it over. So uh, it treated the symptoms of malaria, the, the agues, the, fe the shaking fevers. It, uh, they used it to treat yellow fever and typhus and typhoid. Um, yeah, it was just really, really important plant. Interestingly enough, um, when my mother was uh, with dad, who was stationed in Miami during World War II, she got sick and the doctor said, gee, if we hadn't eradicated dengue fever, I would say that you had dengue fever. But dengue fever uh, may have been eradicated, but with climate change, the mosquitoes that carry it are able to survive farther north and dengue fever is going to probably make a, a, a comeback. And bone set, which is the plant on the left, um, was called bone set because it treated the symptoms of break bone fever. It's got a fever that's so bad you just feel like your bones are breaking. Um, but that, that was dengue fever, and so remember that plant. More wetland plants, uh, jewel weed on the top um, left and middle. Um, that has a really succulent stem, and the succulent stem has got some antifungal qualities to it and can be used for athlete's foot or other things like that. Mosquito bites, poison ivy. There's an old saying, God put the cure where she put the disease. So if you're out in the, in the bog and getting mis bitten by mosquitoes, you can use the juice from a, a jewel weed plant. The middle picture shows a, a young fruit of that plant. When the fruits get bigger, they get, you can see the, the seeds are brown inside. Touch me not is another name for jewel weed, and it's called touch me not because when you pinch the bottom of that fruit, it explodes and sends the seeds away from the plant. But if you can catch the brown seeds and eat them, they're really nut-like in flavor. Um, yellow lady slipper, that blows me away. It was used uh, to treat a large variety of what they called nervous disorders, uh, insomnia, epilepsy, um, nerves of various kinds, and apparently it was a medicine that didn't have any side effects. And the other thing it was used for was the powdered root was used to treat toothaches. And apparently some of these uh, roots of these lady slipper orchids were so strong that they practically extracted the tooth during the treatment, but it really numbed up the area. Um, the top plant on the right is great lobelia. Uh, nice, likes to have its feet kind of moist. Um, its scientific name is Lobelia syphilitica. Now the first case of syphilis that was recorded in Europe in 1493. And if that suggests something to you, you're right. Apparently, low-grade syphilis was endemic in some of the populations of Native Americans here. And when the, the Europeans came over, they picked it up, and it was kind of like revenge for smallpox. When it got over to Europe, it absolutely raged through Europe. It reached China in 10 years. Um, the crowned heads of Europe were being wiped out by the disease. Great lobelia is one of the plants that the Native Americans used to treat the very mild symptoms that they experienced here. They didn't know anything about systemic medicine, but they treated symptoms. And it, they was brought over to the old world and did nothing for syphilis as it was uh, being experienced over there. The bottom right is uh, swamp milkweed. Again, milkweed is a, an important fiber plant. But this was also uh, the Meskwaki or fox Indians that lived in this area use this plant, it was guaranteed to get rid of all of your internal parasites in one hour. Wild rose, um, used for a hay fever, uh, for, mainly for eye problems, especially for like the runny eyes you get with hay fever, uh, and a number of other medicinal uses, but the uh, rose hips 
are, if you take three wild rose, rose hips, they have as much vitamin C in them as a, an orange. You have to be really careful because the uh, rose hips are bristly and you do not want to consume the bristles because they will irritate your intestinal tract. So if you're ever going to try one of these things, be sure to rub all the bristles off. And if you buy them commercially, make, you know, just kind of check that. Um, arrowhead on the right hand side has a very edible tuber, which is also called duck potato, is, is important food. Gold thread was another eye uh, treatment. Um, and it's just a little plant, it's only a few inches tall and uh, the reason for that quote is if you were going to collect gold thread to sell it, uh, it has, actually has gold roots, but you're sitting in a wetland with mosquitoes all around on a hot day and, and I can't imagine how many gold thread roots would take to make a pound. Many, 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 many. We're out in the bog now. Sundew on the top left uh, was another freckle remover. And it was also used like um, bed straw was used as a thickener for uh, curdling milk into cheese. It's a, it's a vegetarian milk curdler. The normal milk curdler is made out of a beef product. So freckles, yes. Um, in the middle we have pitcher plant, the flower on top and the, um, and the pitchers underneath. Um, pitcher plants, uh, genus is Saracinia and um, uh, it was named after Dr. Sarazin in Montreal who used the plant to treat people who had smallpox. And he swore that people had a shorter disease and fewer smallpox scars uh, when they used pitcher plants. It was also used to collect berries. The little pitcher was used to collect berries in. And uh, there were some charms for it too. Uh, cranberry. On the upper right, that is the basis of our whole commercial cranberry uh, crop, is, is that little wild cranberry. And the bottom right is sphagnum moss. And sphagnum moss, when it's dry, <coughs> can absorb 20 times its weight in liquid. So it was liquid, it was, it was pampers. Mm -hmm. They used to put it into the cradle boards when they packed the babies in there. And it was also feminine hygiene products. It has, it's antibacterial, uh, so that helped with the cradle boards, it helped with the, with the diaper rash. Poison sumac, the guy on the, on the upper right. Counter irritant, as far as I can, can, can see, means that it's something that takes your mind off your original condition. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, like if your toe hurts, poke yourself in the arm and you won't feel your toe. So at any rate, the idea of rubbing poison sumac sap on somebody who was paralyzed and thinking that it was curing them somehow because they were twitching. This, this is Victorian medicine. Glad I'm not there. Uh, it also interestingly made a permanent, blue, a permanent black ink and it was also used as a boot black in uh, shoe factories except that the people who worked with it were always coming down with poison sumac mm -hmm. because like 85 percent of the population gets it. If you get poison ivy you'll get poison sumac and even a little bit more so it's the, it's the same oil. Um, on the top left we have uh, tamarack, uh, medicinal and, and edible uses but it was also used, the rootlets were used for sewing. So you've heard the expression, it takes a village. Well, it takes a village to make a canoe because the bark, the outer covering, it was usually bark, sometimes elm. The outer covering was, was birch. Um, the skeleton of it was cedar, which is the next one down. The thread that was used to sew everything together was tamarack rootlets. And the caulk to keep, make sure it didn't leak was uh, spruce tar. So that's four trees to make a single product there. So cedar, again, cedar had some edible and medicinal properties. Um, one of the more interesting ones that it was, it was, the cedar charcoal was used in a tattoo. And Native Americans used tattoos as sort of a charm. If you, if you have um, arthritis in your elbow, you get a little tattoo there. And not only does it, is it supposed to relieve the symptoms, but it also is supposed to keep the arthritis from returning. Does it work? I don't know. Maybe so. Maybe we're missing out on a good bet here. And as, uh, willow down at the bottom right hand side is aspirin on the hoof. For millennia people have been harvesting 
willows and making pain relievers and fever reducers out of uh, the bark. It was believed that the more bitter the willow, the better medicine it was. Except you got to what my father would call the point of diminishing returns where it tasted so bad that you couldn't get it in your mouth. So then they had to find some of the sweeter willows to, uh, to cut it with. And out on the prairie. Milkweed. But milkweed was, uh, again, a fiber plant. Um, I've, I keep reading this, the milkweed flower, when it has dew on the morning, people would take that and they would squeeze it into a pot and they would cook that down and it made like a brown sugar substance. And it's really hard for me to understand how many milkweeds you'd have to squeeze in order to get something that you would actually be able to cook down. The um, pods were eaten, they were thrown in bison stews. Um, it says there, what, nine pounds of fluff equals one mattress. I also can't picture what nine pounds of milkweed fluff looks like. You know, does it fill half this room? <laughs> but back in World War II, uh, it was discovered that um, the milkweed fluff made a good insulator. So a lot of the flight suits in World War II were insulated with milkweed fluff. And kids were given burlap bags and told to go out and pick milkweed pods, and they were given a quarter or 50 cents for a bag full of, of milkweed. Um, not only was it a good insulator, and those uh, B-52s were not exactly what you'd call climate controlled, unless you mean the inside was the same temperature as the outside. But uh, they were not only warmer in their milkweed fluff flight suits, but they were also more floatable in their milkweed fluff uh, flight suits. So. Uh, the big orange strip on the bottom there is, uh, is one of the milkweeds. Uh, pleurisy root is one name for it, um, which tells you what it was used for medicinally. It's the only milkweed that does not have a milky sap. And what's its real name? Butterfly weed. Butterfly weed. And it really is butterfly weed. And the plant in the upper right is a relative of the milkweeds. It's uh, in, called Indian hemp, and it's one of the dog banes. And though that is a, a, a really important fiber plant. The mints over on the left-hand side, uh, in the middle we have wild bergamot. On the far left we have uh, lemon horse mint, and the bottom one is mountain mint, Virginia mountain mint. Uh, the mints traditionally have been used as medications for indigestion and stomach problems. You know, when you're feeling a little, little out of it, you'll have some mint tea and that really fixes you up. Uh, and they're also used for various colds and coughs, bronchial symptoms. Uh, the, the strongest, they were also harvested for oils, mm -hmm. and the strongest oil comes from the lemon horse mint. And it was also used, it, apparently that can raise a blister on people, the oil on that is so strong, but it was also used as a hair dressing by Native Americans. Um, the one on the far right is called Queen of the Prairie. Fantastic, looks like cotton candy, doesn't bloom for very long, but it just really dresses up a prairie. It likes moist prairies. And that is the prairie source for aspirin, salicylic acid. And who have we got in the middle? Oh, we've got uh, wild onion. And that was an important food plant. Goldenrod on the top uh, left. Um, what, there is one species of goldenrod that was used by the, um, by the Americans after the Boston Tea Party. It was, the leaves were used as a tea substitute. We don't have it growing here in the Midwest. Uh, one of the native Midwestern tribes believed in bathing the babies in a milk, or excuse me, a goldenrod bath to make sure that they would grow up with a sense of humor. <laughs> and I say, let's have more of that. Um, Thomas Edison believed that if we ever lost our, our sources of foreign rubber, if a war or anything shut down latex um, sources, that milk, or excuse me, goldenrod had enough latex in it to be viable as a commercial substitute. And he actually did some hybridizing. Uh, goldenrods like to hybridize anyhow, but he did some hybridizing and came up with 12 foot tall goldenrods. And at one point, Henry Ford gave him a Model T Ford 
that had tires on it that were made out of goldenrod rubber. So apparently it is doable, but maybe not in, in large quantities. People always ask me how Native Americans avoided getting bitten by mosquitoes, and I'm not sure that they did. But um, white sage on the bottom left was thrown into fires and sort of smudged to help keep the mosquitoes away. Uh, the middle plant is Coreopsis, beautiful, beautiful prairie plant. And one of the things, if you take that yellow flower and you, I'm trying to think if you boil it or not. I think you boil it. It turns the water red and makes a really nice beverage, apparently, from what I read. But also it is a beverage that you would drink if you were a pregnant woman and you wanted to ensure that you had a girl child. So, all right. Um, compass plant on the right, called compass plant because the young groups of leaves, at any rate, orient themselves so that they face north and south. Um, the pith in the upper third of the stem is a prairie chewing gum. And there's some interesting superstitions with this. There are some of the tribes out on the plains that would never camp anywhere near um, compass plant because they believed it drew lightning to the site. And there are some plants, some tribes that made sure that they camped near compass plant because it repelled lightning. So take your choice. Cardinal flower likes wet or kind of moist prairies. Uh, this is another one that was used in tattoos uh, to, to keep away illnesses. Um, echinacea in the middle is one of our TV drugs that um, uh, they try to sell us. My, my older sister, whenever she feels a cold coming, she go, gets, goes and gets her echinacea and she believes firmly that it is a, helps her immune system. Uh, so did the Plains tribes. It was one of the most important plants on the, uh, in the Great Plains. Uh, they used it for distemper. They used it in horses. They used it to treat rattlesnake bites. They used it for a, a bunch of different uh, pretty drastic cures. Um, interestingly enough, the, uh, the echinacea comes from the Greek word for hedgehog, which kind of explains what that seed head looks like, and that was used as a hairbrush. And the um, liatris, or gay feather, or blazing star, has a root that it tastes kind of carroty. And some of the Plains tribes would harvest it and then store it, you know, just like bananas. I like bananas when I, they're just able to peel them, and they're really green, and most people like to wait until the sugars develop. But uh, when this one, when the root of the uh, liatris ages for a while, the sugars develop, so it's a little bit uh, sweeter. So we've seen a lot of edible and medicinal. We've talked about a little bit about construction materials. Just as our culture has plenty of lucky charms, uh, the Native Americans did too. So as I said, if you think, if, uh, think of a plant list for any given place, a lot of it was useful in one way or another. We got a plant. It has roots, it has a stem, it has leaves, it may have twigs, it has buds, it has flowers, it has seeds. All those are potential food or medicine. Is the plant going to be good for a food or a beverage or is it going to be a poison or is it going to be a, a medicine? Um, and if so, how do you use it? Do you, do you harvest it at a certain time? The Europeans believed that there were certain plants that were medicinal that only could be harvested when the moon was full. So maybe there's a special time to harvest it. Maybe it has to be a certain age when you harvest it. Uh, maybe you have to dry it before you can eat it. Uh, Jack in the Pulpit had the nickname of memory plant because if you ever ate the Jack in the Pulpit root raw, you remembered it. <laughs> okay, so that's a plant that had to be aged for five or six months before the, um, it could be used for food. So there are all these different combinations and there are all these different parts and there's all these different possible uses for them. And now I'm going to ask you, besides the doctrine of signature, which says if it's shaped my, like my liver, it's good for my liver, what would you guess for uh, how they figured it out? So let's, let's try it on Herb and see what happens. Okay, so trial, trial and error, that would be one. Yeah. Watch the, watching the animals. Okay, 
watching the animals uh, is a really good, especially if you're in a, an area that has apes, because apes are really good at um, eating things that are, we can also eat. Um, so, okay, so trial and error, watching the animals. Effectiveness. Effective, well, you've got to try it first. Okay. Communication with other groups. Okay, communication with other groups. Should we go to the Cliff's Notes version of this now? Okay, so we have Doctrine of Signature. Try, letting animals try it is a lovely name. I like to tell kids that that's going to be on their next spelling test. Zoopharmacognosy. Okay. Trial and error. Related plants. These people came over the top of the world, at least some of them did, and they found plants in the new world that reminded them of plants that they had left behind in the old world. So maybe they were already familiar with a relative of that plant. Acclimatization, as I said, they were not moving fast. 7,000 years to go 10,000 miles is not a, not a real fast march. So as they lived in an area for a while, they just kind of got used to the plants there and probably got more adventuresome about trying the plants. And then there's the last one. And I have to tell you, my dad was an attorney. And the idea of having something like this in print under my name just gives me the heebie-jeebies. There's a guy named Tom Brown who has a bunch of books about outdoor survival. And in one of his books, he talks about edible plants and medicinal plants. And what he says is, if you sit down next to the plant and you empty your mind of all the 20th century, 21st century garbage that is in there, the plant will inform you about whether it's good or bad, and if it's a good plant, he doesn't use good and bad. If it's a good plant, um, what is it good for? It is in print, I could show you the book. And it sounds like lawsuit heaven to me, but uh, <laughs> on the other hand, I have a friend who's a botanist who says that I'm an overeducated Cornell graduate who wouldn't know a vibe if it came up and bit me. So there is that, but um, we'll just put it on the list, vibes. And it's typical to end a program about nature with uh, a sunset slide, so I gave you the, uh, a lunar eclipse instead. So, Does anybody have any questions? As I say, a monster amount of information, and what I gave you was you know, a small percentage of the information that you could collect if you started with the list of plants that you've just seen. So any questions? Yeah.